When Russia's president visited New Delhi earlier this month, one of the most closely watched questions was not about trade or energy. It was whether India would seriously entertain a renewed offer of Russia's Su-57E stealth fighter. According to open reporting, Moscow is again trying to position the Su-57E as India's next-generation option, tying it to promises of industrial cooperation and the possibility of additional Russian fighters to boost squadron numbers. The pitch is simple. Stay inside the Russian combat aircraft ecosystem for another generation instead of relying only on Western jets and domestic designs. For India, the choice is far more complex. The Indian Air Force already operates French Rafales, is fielding its domestically built Tejas fighters, and is investing heavily in the Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft Program, which is meant to be India's own fifth-generation fighter. Bringing in a new Russian fifth-generation type on top of that would affect everything from logistics and budgets to how India balances foreign suppliers against its domestic projects. So, in today's video, we're taking a closer look at Russia's renewed Su-57 offer for India and what it really means for India's future fighter fleet. Let's dive in. The idea of an Indian-Russian fifth-generation fighter once had a different label, the Fifth Generation Fighter Aircraft, or FGFA. For more than a decade, India and Russia worked on that program, which was meant to be an Indian variant of what eventually became the Su-57. Over time, differences grew over cost, technology transfer, and whether the design met India's expectations on stealth, avionics, and engine maturity. By 2018, New Delhi had effectively stepped away and shifted its focus toward developing the advanced medium combat aircraft instead. Meanwhile, the Su-57 has moved from prototype to limited service with the Russian Aerospace Forces. Open sources suggest that only a relatively small fleet will be available by the late 2020s compared to earlier plans, and that production has been slower than first announced. In the war against Ukraine, most credible reporting indicates that Su-57s have been used mainly to launch long-range standoff weapons from within Russian airspace rather than flying frequent deep missions against dense air defenses. The aircraft is in service and firing weapons, but its operational record is still narrow and carefully managed. In this context, Russia is once again pitching the Su-57E to India. Recent reports say the offer centers on the Su-57E, alongside discussions on Su-35M fighters and industrial cooperation. The idea is that conventional fighters could arrive sooner to cover squadron gaps, with the Su-57E following later, potentially with local production or assembly in India. For Moscow, winning India as a Su-57E customer would solve several problems at once. It would bring in export revenue as sanctions and the war strain Russia's aerospace sector help stabilize production lines beyond limited domestic orders, and send a political signal that Russia's newest fighter still has export appeal, despite no confirmed foreign operator so far. For India, the decision sits within a crowded modernization push. The Air Force still aims for about 42 fighter squadrons, but operates well below that after retiring MiG-21s and other legacy jets. To close the gap, New Delhi has bought 36 Rafales with more planned inducted Tejas Mark 1A and is backing Tejas Mark 2 and the AMCA as its core 2030s programs. Adding the Su-57E wouldn't just mean another aircraft, it would deepen long-term dependence on Russian engines, weapons, and sustainment. India already relies heavily on Russian supply chains for Su-30MKY, MiG-29 variants, S-400, and more. And recent years have shown how sanctions, export controls, and Russia's wartime priorities can disrupt those links. That risk is why many Indian and Western analysts argue for reducing, not expanding, reliance on Russian systems. There is also the sanctions and diplomatic aspect. A major new high-end fighter deal with Russia would be watched closely in Washington and European capitals, 
at the same time that India is deepening defense cooperation with them on other projects. India has so far managed to introduce S-400 while still expanding ties with the United States and Europe, but repeating that pattern with a high-profile Su-57E purchase could create fresh political friction, or at least add complexity to those relationships. On paper, Su-57E would give India a stealth-shaped airframe with internal weapons bays, a modern radar and sensor suite, and the potential to field advanced air-to-air -air and air-to-surface weapons. The question is less about theoretical performance and more about delivery timelines, reliability, and how much real technology access India would get beyond assembly work and limited customization. Russia is still scaling up its own fleet, and its industry is already committed to multiple strategic programs under wartime conditions. By comparison, expanding the Rafale fleet gives India more of an aircraft that is already in service, with an established training pipeline, maintenance infrastructure, and stable support from France. Investing in Tejas Mark II and AMCA keeps more value and know-how inside India, and fits the broader push for greater self-reliance, even if those programs inevitably face delays and technical challenges. This approach also spreads risk across several partners rather than anchoring another generation of combat aviation in Russia. Because of this, many observers see the renewed Su-57E offer less as a simple equipment choice and more as a negotiating tool. India can keep the option visible when it talks to Western suppliers about price, offsets, and technology transfer. Russia, for its part, can point to ongoing conversations with India as evidence that its fighter designs still attract serious interest abroad. Both sides gain some leverage just by keeping the dialogue active, even if an actual contract remains uncertain. In the end, New Delhi has to balance three main priorities. It needs to close its fighter squadron gap in the near term. It wants to build up its own aerospace industry through Tejas, AMCA, and other indigenous projects. And it has to manage its strategic relationships, maintaining enough distance from Russia to deepen ties with the United States, Europe, Japan, and others, while still extracting value from existing Russian defense links. So far, India's choices have pointed toward more diversification and more domestic development, not a return to a deep fifth-generation partnership with Russia that already stalled once. That does not mean Su-57E is impossible, but it does mean any deal would need to offer clear, tangible benefits on technology, timelines, and cost to outweigh the political and industrial downsides. But what do you think? Is India really likely to commit to the Su-57 this time? Or is this mostly about keeping options open and gaining leverage in other negotiations? Let us know in the comments below. And if you found this video insightful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to Defense Central for the latest defense news and analysis.